All right, Joe, so here's my question. How did you become so interested in telehealth so many years before literally everybody else? Well, it goes back to a, a trait uh, uh, that I think at least the, uh, during that part of my career, so we're, we're going back almost 30 years now to the early 90s. And uh, I, at that time, I, I really did believe that if, if I had an insight on anything, that I was probably one of the last people on the planet to have that insight. It's an insecurity thing. Um, I've kind of grown out of it nowadays, but so, so that's, that's an important part of the story. What, what happened was I was in a bit of a career shift. I had started my uh, academic career in the laboratory with like many people in the Harvard system. And uh, it just wasn't going particularly well for me. I wasn't that motivated by what I was studying and by the intensity of basic science. So I was looking for other things to do. And my department chair said, well, there's this new technology called digital imaging. Uh, we think maybe it could be of high enough resolution to substitute for Kodachrome slides. And we might even be able to use it for clinical diagnosis. So I was off looking at that technology in a very specific research project. And I literally had an epiphany one day that, gee, <clears throat> if this works, that we can separate the knowledge of clinical care from being in the same room with a patient. And I thought that opens up so many opportunities. The other thing that was happening in the 90s uh, in the U.S. was this intent. And, it, and again, it's, it's true now as well, but this intense pressure on um, whether we wanted to do uh, different kinds of value-based care paradigms and things. So I saw a, a, an opportunity for efficiency. And, uh, and as I said, I said, well, I made this, uh, I had this epiphany. I must be among the last people, so I better get going. So I started with Ernest and building a team and building a program and I was convinced that I was late to the game. So that's kind that's of That's incredible. Story. I mean, you yeah. you were definitely not among the last for sure. Um, <laughs> so this has been a almost, I guess, a 20 year evolution. And, and, and in the early days, I can't imagine people were asking the same questions. I, I, I'm told that there was a lot more, you know, show me why, show me the data, show me why this is important. And, and how has that changed? I guess only over the last year. So from 20 years of Oh, trying to convince people of something. So tell me a little bit about the early days and, and then to this year where I, I guess the questions aren't really, is this even a rational approach? It's, you know, it's happening. How, how, how do we do it? Yeah, that, it is interesting. So in the beginning there was, it was very much like any, I think medical, any innovation in the medical field gets put through a, uh, and, and, it, and by the way, there's a good reason for this, which is we, we never want to hurt our patients, right? So. If I come up with a new, well, let's take laparoscopic surgery as an example, right? We used to take gall, gallbladders out by cutting you open and removing them. Now, it, you can't, that's malpractice. But when laparoscopic surgery came into being, it was a new thing. It had to go through clinical trials. People had to prove it wasn't unsafe. And the same applied to telehealth and, and digital medicine uh, in the beginning. It was lots of negativity about um, you know, I have to see the patient. I had a heart failure doctor lecture me. Oh, I have to see the neck veins and you can't do this and that. So it was that skepticism. And so I, the answer to that was I, my favorite phrase was, well, I think that's an impaired question. Let's do a test and find out. And so for the first dozen or so years or 10 years, anyway, we, we it was a research project or multiple research projects hmm. with a goal of showing that quality would not be eroded. And we did prove that. Uh, then we shifted into a mode where, and again, the, the, the timing is rough, so may, maybe it was more than 10 years that we did the quality part, but we shifted into a mode uh, where people were more like interested in how to solve for workflow and how to solve for reimbursement. And we stayed in that mode really till April or March or April of, of 2020 when things exploded because of the 
intensity of lockdown and the insistence of the federal government, at least in the U.S. And I have some stats from other countries. We might want to get to that as well. But the, the, the federal government in the U.S. saying we, we will relax all these regulatory burdens that we had put on this this industry and and it took off. Um, well, let's get into all that. But, but first, th there are some terms here that are slightly confusing because some of them are legal terms, others are medical terms, and then again, mm -hmm. there's obviously IT terms. So I I'm just going to kind of line up a, a, a bunch of terms here. And, and if you can clear up whether there's just historically different phases of the development or to you they or, or to the government, they mean different things. So connected health is my understanding what was a term that was used early on. I know telehealth much more. That was certainly in my academic uh, work, uh, you know, throughout the 90s and 2000s. That was the, the term for it. But then digital medicine started to sort of take off and, you know, corresponded with the trend in sort of digital and everything was digital. Mm -hmm. uh, now it seems like you at least are starting to call it virtual care. What, if anything, do all these terms mean and do they have a historical or legal meaning, medical meaning? What, what's the difference between these terms? Well, I have to be candid with you and say I, I, one of the things I, I don't like about our field is that we keep changing names. Um, and in the beginning, I think people did that because they felt like if they invented a new name, it would the spotlight would shine shine on them. Um, so Connected Health came out of our group. Uh, we, we sort of claim credit for, for coining that term. And the reason we coined that term in the mid-2000s, the middle of that decade was because believe it or not telemedicine was a term nobody wanted to hear they just sort of said yeah we tried that it didn't work and it was a little bit before the the era that you just described where it was digital health digital medicine was kind of the term so we said well we were working with a guy who was doing a lot of research in connected home that was his thing and we sort of said well why don't we do connected health and it took off <laughs> But it was purely self-serving in the sense that we wanted people to listen to us, and they did. They're like, "Oh, that's interesting. What are you talking about?" Uh, it was it was telehealth with a with a new name on it. So that happens. We, you you didn't mention e health. You didn't mention m health. Those were terms sure. of art for a while. I'll say digital medicine, digital health are very broad umbrella terms that can include everything from uh, supply chain automation to devices to anything that has a digital component in the in the ecosystem of, of healthcare, which is again, very broad. Um, uh, informatics would fall under that, um, electronic health records, all part of digital health. And then there's the part about care delivery using technology like uh, video or audio or uh, asynchronous communication, say over a patient portal. We call that bundle telehealth because it's actually using tele to provide health care. Um, and I think that takes care of most of the ones you mentioned. It, it is, it's a, again, it's a bit of a, a, a nest of uh, confusion and, and I don't feel good about that. I, I have to say virtual wasn't one I invented, but it was foisted on me. Uh, so I said, okay, fine, if we want to call it that. People seem to want to bring a new adjective in because it somehow makes it like a new thing again, and it's the same old thing. So that's my well, it's the same old thing. But on the other hand, the the word care is different from from medicine, uh, mm -hmm. right? Is that the behavioral trend? The the last one, sort of virtual care, is that because you're focusing more on the kind of behavioral medicine aspect? I think it's meant to imply that there's a one of the things that digital does is it it it's a bit of a, uh, uh, it, it's a, it democratizes, um, right? So we, the first phase of, of that was back when uh, all of a sudden people could get all of our textbooks on the internet and people would walk into my office with, well, I, I diagnosed myself, doc, I have lichen planus and this is a picture I saw of my rash. And, and now of course, everything is there and it's much more interactive. So it's meant to imply that the care is a two-way street and the digital tools enable us to have a very um, interactive um, care care uh, experience with our patients whereas medicine is much more clinical and it's in its connotation it's 
what I as a clinician feel like I need both to, to make a diagnosis and craft a care plan um, independent of whether I'm going to actually care for someone, if that makes sense. But what are some of the more interesting cases? Uh, I had a couple in mind. I wanted to, to, to touch certainly on imaging. I know that's something that you know is relevant in, in any case. And uh, and I had a special interest to just hear your, your take on melanoma since that's your, uh, well, I guess one of your fields. Tell me a little bit about how uh, how the use cases are evolving and what you are looking at as the more in, insightful sort of n- new types of use cases. Well, it's a wonderful question. I, I, I guess I start by the last year was really the headline was that the doctor's office made it into your living room and ev- everyone, at least I think in the U.S., virtually everyone experienced that. There were just, I just saw my... Uh, paper copy of the Journal of the American Medical Association yesterday and and there are three articles, there are two articles in an editorial around this this topic. Uh, And again, to the point we were making earlier, it's no longer is this uh, a a legitimate way of providing care, but what what do we need to do to, to integrate it and knit it in? So there's still a lot to do in that space. Now, the, the good and the bad of that is that it, it's all about virtual video visits, which candidly aren't that innovative or that interesting, but, it, but it's something we know, which is a visit with our doctor taken into your life by using a technology. And so everyone is, is immediately relatively comfortable with that, and which is why it took off the way it did and even Health plans now are a lot of them. As we as we start to look at the future of what we do after the pandemic, are insisting that we do this by video. Then there's a, quite a bit of debate on audio only, and it has to do with disparities and the like. So, I just mentioned that because any other use case we might talk about is, uh, for better or worse, pretty peripheral to that these days. 